Already we have introduced Brother Michael, and we will spend a little time on that now. He's preaching now for about 14 years at the Bellevue Congregation in Pensacola, Florida. He has been on many lecture shifts. He edits Defender in their bulletin. He has taught in various places and has known quite well for his faithfulness and ability as a preacher of the gospel and defender of the faith. And we're very grateful for him this evening, willing, and he volunteered since he had a sermon available to fill in for Brother Jesse. Sorry, Brother Jesse's sick with the flu, but it uh, seems, as I said earlier, to be kind of moving around here and there. He said he'd been down nearly about two weeks, and the doctor wanted to drive, um, I started saying, under the influence. But it is under the medicine. He didn't want to drive under the medicine he's taking. Uh, so anyway, we're glad to have Brother Michael, and let's now listen to the sermon he has to prepare. I certainly wish Brother Jesse was here. It'd be a lot easier for me. Uh, and I hope as I start this, this kind of makes sense. Uh, I haven't looked at this material in quite a while, but uh, hopefully we will struggle through it and it will make some sense to you and maybe help, you, help us out in dealing with these subjects. I do appreciate the congregation here, the elders, uh, the invitation to come and be a part of this lectureship. Uh, it's always certainly one of the highlights of my years. Uh, I appreciate all the members of this congregation and the way that you stand behind the elders here. Uh, and those who help, as we call it, behind the scenes of the lectureship because there's a great deal of work that goes on behind the scenes that nobody ever sees, but without that work, a successful lectureship would not be taking place. And so for all of those who engage in those works, it is greatly appreciated. Bible translation, it's a difficult subject, and especially when we go into a bookstore, Bible bookstore, and we start looking at all the Bibles on the shelves. And we sit back and we start scratching our head and wondering, what in the world should I buy? What's a good translation? And we generally ask the uh, same people, ask the people who work at the bookstores, and they have absolutely no knowledge as to what they're talking about. They generally tell you, well, this one here, and they go to the NIV, and they recommend that because the NIV is one of the most widely bought Bibles, and I use that word loosely, as we will talk about in a little bit. Uh, it's one of the most widely purchased today, uh, along with the old reliable King James Mossback people's version. And I uh, say that jokingly. But before we really get into these translations, I want to go back because a lot of times we'll hear, hear comments, well, there's thousands of mistakes in the Bible. And so the idea is, since there's thousands of mistakes, it doesn't really matter what you use. Just pick one out and it'll be all right. You can't really trust any of them anyway. Well, that's about as false as could be. Sometimes those who will say that will have a smidgen of knowledge to make a comment such as, why well, there's over 200,000 mistakes in the Bible, or errors in the Bible. Well, what does that mean? Are there 200,000 or over 200,000 mistakes? Well, variations do occur. Uh, 
But what is a variation? You have to understand the words a lot of times that these people use. If a single word, for example, is misspelled in 3,000 different manuscripts, then you have 3,000 variations. So there's a lot of your errors in the Bible. For example, one friend or manuscript might have Jesus Christ, while another manuscript might have Christ Jesus. Well, that's an error. And I want you to know that, that is an error, a mistake, according to their counting of that they're going to add to all of these hundreds of thousands. Even if all of the words are represented and properly represented, they're still going to count it as variation. Sometimes it is different in, difference in spelling. Oftentimes, names and words are spelled differently in different manuscripts. For example, the pool in, that's recorded in John 5 and verse, three, uh, verse 2, it's spelled three, four, five, six, seven different ways. That's Satan. Seven different ways. Now then, that's seven different errors, mistakes. So a lot of these mistakes that you hear about really aren't mistakes at all. It's just a variation of counting and the ways in which these things are counted. The point that I want to make in all of this is that we can trust the Bible and the words of the Bible. We have them accurately portrayed within a reliable translation of the scriptures. By far, the great majority of variations have absolutely no bearing on the text whatsoever. For example, Norman Giesler and William Nix wrote in their book a general introduction to the Bible. How significant are the variants? It is easy to leave the wrong impression by speaking of 200,000 errors which have crept into the text by the scribal mistakes and intended corrections. It was already mentioned that there are only 10,000 places where these 200,000 variants occur. The next question is, how significant are these 10,000 places? Textual critics have attempted to answer this question by offering the following percentages and comparisons. A. Westcott and Hort estimated that only about one-eighth of all variants had any weight, as most of them are merely mechanical matters such as spelling or style. And of the whole, then, only about one-sixteenth rise above trivialities, or can in any sense be called substantial variations. Mathematically, this would compute to a text that is 98.33% pure. B. Ezra Abbott gave similar figures, saying that about 1920, 95% of the readings are various rather than rival readings. And 1920 or 95% of the remainder are of so little importance that their adoption of or rejection makes no appreciable difference in the same passage. Philip Schaff summarized that of all the 150,000 variations known in his day, only 400 affected the sense, and of these, only 50 were of any or of real significance. And of this total, not one affected an article of faith or a precept of duty which is not abundantly sustained by other and undoubt, undoubted passages or by the whole tenor of scripture's teachings. The A.T. Robertson suggested that the real concern of textual criticism is of a thousandth part 
of the entire text. This would make the reconstructed text of the New Testament 99.9% .9 free of substantial or consequential error. He goes on, uh, basically all of these so-called mistakes amount to nothing. And that's really what we wanted to emphasize as we begin. We have God's Word. And we have God's Word in a reliable text of the Bible or translation of the Bible. But what really gets to the point and the heart of the whole matter is what is called a philosophical approach to translation. Translation, first off, is authorized. Some have almost gone to the position in writing that they, unless you read the Greek and the Hebrew, you really can't even understand the Bible. Uh, that's false. Jesus and the apostles used the Septuagint translation of the Old Testament. The Septuagint was the Bible of the Jews during the first century. And yet Paul would write, and he was again using the Septuagint translation in Romans 3 and verse 2, much every way, chiefly because under them were committed the oracles of God. And so he calls this Septuagint translation that they are using, this is the oracles of God. When I have a reliable translation of the Bible, that's God's word. I don't have to be concerned about it being the word of the translators when it is reliably translated. Translation is the rendering of the original text faithfully into another language. That's what translation is. You take the one language and bringing over the text into another language faithfully. Another word that needs to be understood is the word interpretation. Interpretation is explaining what has been said or written. Translation is the first step of interpretation when needed. In Luke the 24th chapter in verse 25 through 27, Jesus says, O fool and, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded, that word expounded, the American Standard uses the word interpreted unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now was he translating, bringing the words and the text of the Hebrew into their language? No, he was explaining what those words meant. That's interpretation. Another phrase that you will hear often in this discussion is word-for-word -word translation. A lot of times when you hear that word, that phrase, you have to basically ask, well, what does the author mean by it? Because it is used in a variation of ways. If they're talking about here you have one word of one language and you bring that one word into another language using only one word and keeping the exact same order of words that you have from the source language into the target language, then no, that's not possible. You just cannot do that with translation. It often takes more than one word to translate a word into a, another language. And the order of words in some languages are very important, while in other languages it's not important. And so the order of words might have to change. 
in order to translate from one language into another language. But now then, if I can, get you to think of a line starting over on one side and going to the other side. If I had a blackboard up here, I'd just draw a line up here. All translation can be placed on this line. On one end, we have this idea more of word for word with the same order approach to the very best of one's ability. This is called, in technical language, formal or form equivalence. Sometimes they use the term modified literal. This idea is trying to stay as close to the original as is possible to translate it from one language into another language. Here, with this type of translation, the emphasis is on the source of the translation itself. It tries to catch the mood, the essence, and the flavor of the original, and yet still be readable and understandable in the target language, or the language in which it's being translated into. On the opposite end of the line, then, we have basically what is referred to as paraphrase sometimes. It is the term dynamic equivalence or functional equivalence, or the formal terms that are used in relationship to this type of, and I put translation in quotes along that line, but in this type of translation. Here, with this type, the emphasis is not on the original, it is on the receptor of the translation. In other words, you have, for example, the Greek here. The emphasis is not on the Greek text, it's on the English that's being translated into. That's the idea that is being presented. It's more concerned with, the term is readability, and communication of what the text says not actually what the text says. And that's the difference. The NIV, which, again, that's uh, one of the most, if not the most popular selling Bible today, in the preference to it, it uses the phrase, quote, fidelity to the thought of the biblical writers, end quote not the words, but their thoughts. The process of this type of translation is that the translator interprets what the words of the Bible mean. And what those words would mean to the people of the first century. And then they set out to rewrite those words to try to convey the meaning to the modern reader. Again, it has no real concern with the actual words themselves. It's dealing with what they think it means. That's the idea of this idea of dynamic equivalence or paraphrase. But you need to ask some questions when you read, the, when you come across this. What happens when the translator's interpretation is wrong? Now understand their process, they are interpreting what they believe the words of the Bible mean, and then they're going to tell you what it means. They're not going to give you the actual words themselves. They're telling you, here's what it means. What if they're wrong? 
and what it means. What do you have then? And then what happens when that misinterpretation is then written into the text of the Bible? This approach to Bible translation, or to translation in general, eliminates all possible interpretations other than the translator's one view of that, uh, those words. And thus, if a passage is open to differing views, they eliminate all those views except for the one that they like and that they choose. It takes that ability away from the person who's going to be studying it to come to the conclusion, okay, here's what it means. Because I've read the text and I've come to this conclusion. They say, oh no, you can't do that. I'm going to tell you what it means, and I'm going to eliminate that possibility that you might have. That approach is, in fact, interpretation, not translation. It is a running paraphrase and commentary parading itself as God's word. If it paraded itself as simply a commentary, well, that would be a whole different matter. Any commentator can write a commentary. But when they parade it off as God's word, then we're in dangerous ground. And that's what is taking place with the majority of what is referred to as modern-day translations because the majority of latter-day translations are based on this view of dynamic equivalence. In fact, the majority of individuals that are translating today go to and argue for that type of translation. Now, as I said, all translations can be placed on this line from one end to the other end of the spectrum. Some of them are closer to this idea of word for word, and if you really want to that to the extreme, get you an interlinear, because that does the best as far as word for word and keeping the word order and everything else. You start moving over and farther and farther. You get to, for example, the King James, the New King James over here. Uh, and there's American Standard is over here. And as you continue to move over, you'll see others. And over here, you'll get, for example, the NIV. You'll get the New Living Bible, or the Bible, the New the Living Bible Paraphrase. What is it? Living Bible Paraphrase, okay. You'll get those type of translations over on this, the farther over you go. Every other translation can be placed in this, on this line someplace in the middle, between the two ends. I want us, in some of the remaining time, using the two most popular versions sales-wise today, to give some illustrations of this, these two principles. Two most popular Bibles sales-wise or the King James Translation and the New International Translation, and I use that again loosely. For example, in Romans 1 and verse 17, King James has, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. The New International Version says, For in the Gospel a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the just or the righteous will live by faith. If you go back to the original Greek, the King James in that phrase, 
And that translation is very literal, almost word for word. The NIV, on the other hand, has several problems. For example, it says that um, for in the gospel, the word gospel is not in the original, but it is in the NIV. Now why? Because they interpreted it and, and placed it in there. The phrase, a righteousness that is by, has absolutely no textual basis for it but yet they've inserted it into the text. But then if you look at this idea, by faith from first to last, a very literal rendering of that Greek phrase is not difficult. It would be out of faith into faith, or as the King James has it, from faith to faith. That is a literal rendering of the original text. The NIV does not have even one word correct in it as far as actual translation. There were different interpretations, though. The NIV translators, for example, believed in the doctrine of salvation by faith only. That's not in the Bible, but it is in Romans 1.17 in the NIV. What did they do? They interpreted that phrase from, for, from faith to faith, or out of faith into faith. They interpreted that with their doctrinal biases of faith only and simply inserted it into the text for us. Even though it's not what the original says. Now then, even if you take, okay, could that be an interpretation of that from faith to faith? Even if we had that option, it's still not a valid way of translating the Greek phrase because it would take that study that you have the right to make, it would take it out of your hands and place it in their hands. They simply wrote their false doctrine into the text. Another illustration, 1 Corinthians 13 and verses 9 and verse 10. King James says, For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. And IV comes along and says, For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when perfection comes the imperfect disappears. The original text is making a contrast, and you see that contrast with King James, between that which is in part and that which is perfect, of verse 10. Literally, it is when the perfect thing comes, the out-of-part thing will be done away with. Now, the King James does a very good job in showing that contrast between the perfect and the part. The NIV, though, you would never, in reading the NIV, come to know that the imperfect of verse 10 is the exact same prepositional phrase of the in part in verse 9. The exact same phraseology, just a different word, part, and perfect. Why didn't they translate it the exact same way except using the different terms there? Well, the word disappears then. That when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. What does that mean? It leaves room for some mysterious self-removal of this imperfect, whatever that imperfect is. The original, though, makes it very clear that that which is in part will be done away with, and the source is external to itself. It does not disappear by itself, nor cause itself to go away, is what the original text is indicating there. What they did, though, they had these who believed in modern-day miracles, 
And so they left room in this text for the continuation of miraculous activity until the coming of Christ, whenever that takes place. Why? Because of the Pentecostals on the translation committee. They interpreted it for you and then gave you a rendering that they felt, in reality, justified their denominational biases. Another illustration in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 6. And chapter 2 and verse 1. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in, in you, and then in chapter 2 and verse 1, And I, brethren, when I came unto you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. Notice that those two phrases, the testimony of Christ and then the testimony of God in the King James. But the NIV comes along and says in chapter 1 and verse 6, because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. And then in chapter 2 and verse 1, When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquency or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about Christ or about God. The... King James accurately renders the genitive case which shows possession here. It is the testimony belonging to Christ. It is his. And the testimony that belongs to God. The NIV comes along though and changes that. It's no longer the testimony that belongs to him, but it opens the door for testimonials about Christ what they think about Christ and what they think about God. Instead of giving the testimony which comes from God, the NIV comes along where it says, it's the testimony that I'm giving about him. It changes the source from being from God to being from the individual. And that's testimony. The New, New American Standard lends itself to this view, and again, chapter 1 and verse 6, when it says, even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you. But then, strangely, they corrected in chapter 2 and verse 1, when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superior superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. They couldn't even be consistent from one chapter to the next. And those who use the, NI, the New American Standard, read the preface sometime. And notice the key word, they strive for readability. When you see that word, a red flag ought to come up and say, they're over here with that dynamic equivalence where they're going to interpret the text for you and tell you what it means. They're not striving to tell you what God actually says. Notice that key word in the preface. There's a lot of others, errors that the NIV has written into the text. I've got several other illustrations, but I can see that my time is starting to get uh, short. But basically, these examples the few that I've given, should serve to demonstrate that as one gets away from a literal translation and they start moving to this interpretation of God's word for the reader, that there's going to be problems more and more creeping into the text. Whether or not the interpretation is correct does not make any difference. Because when you do that and you rely upon the translators to interpret it for you, then what about when they do make a mistake? 
the more we move from a modified literal to a dynamic equivalence, the less of God's Word we have and the more of a running commentary we possess. But some people don't know these things. They come in with the New International or one of these other perversions of God's Word. What should we do? Why, you are a liberal, you're a heathen, don't you know? No, we start teaching. And we start showing them the errors that creep into and the problems with this type of a translation. What should we want to use, though? A lot of times, why, why shouldn't I use an NIV? Why would you want to? Why do you want to use a translation, any translation that's going to tell you what they think God's Word means? Instead of sitting down with God's Word yourself and studying it out. Why do you want to use it? Some will use the argument, well, Jesus and his apostles used the Septuagint, and that's a faulty translation. And it's true, the Septuagint was a very defective translation in many respects. It was the Bible of the first century. And yet they, it stated, as we started, that it was God's work. And thus they argue, so we can use faulty translations today. Well, there's a little problem with that. Realize that first that the Septuagint was the only translation of that day. We have the option of using one that's a natural translation, or we have the option of using something that perverts God's Word. Now, which one do we want to use? Let me ask the question, do elders have the right to specify what translation is going to be used in the public teaching and preaching from the pulpit. Absolutely. Elders have the authority within the congregation, and that is an authority that, yes, will extend to the translation that's going to be used in the public proclamation of the truth from that congregation. That is an area, I realize, of expediency, and they have the right to make those decisions in areas of expediency. They also have the obligation to make sure that the truth is being taught and that the sheep are properly fed. Why would they allow then contaminating food to be fed to the members of the flock. And that's what these dynamic equivalent translations are. A contamination of God's Word. They have the obligation of stopping the mouths of the false teacher. What if the false teacher comes in the guise of Bible? NIV write into it salvation by faith only. Once saved, always saved. Pentecostalism, premillennialism. It's in the text of the Bible itself as far as the NIV is concerned. Don't the elders have the obligation to stop its mouth? Absolutely. Oh, but that old King James translation it's old, it's archaic, some of the words have changed meaning, and I just cannot understand those these and thou's. How many times have you heard things like that? Oh yeah. Why? Because they've been fed a bunch of baloney. It's hogwash. We sing the songs with these and thou's in it. We don't have any difficulty, do we? Our kids study Shakespeare, and they can understand it. 
The problem is they want to stay on baby food instead of getting into the text of God's Word and studying the Word of God. And when they get into the text of the Bible, then they'll start learning. Unity? How in the world can we have unity when we have false doctrine written in the text of the Bible? How can we unify upon that unless we unify upon the false teaching? When we have an accurate translation of the Bible, though, we can be unified. And we will be unified if we will adhere to it. Thank you, and I hope that this has helped you a little bit in choosing a Bible translation and understanding the subject.